Welcome, everyone. I'm James Shore, and this is the Art of Agile Development Book Club. Uh, today, we are discussing psychological safety, and I'm very happy to welcome Gita Klickgaard as our special guest today. Uh, Gita is an Agile coach, trainer, and mentor focusing on helping organizations implement psychological safety, responsibility, and accountability. And of course, she wrote the section, The Practice on Psychological Safety, in the book. Gita, welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, we are going to kick things off by reading an excerpt from the book, as usual. Uh, but Gita, since you wrote the section, uh, would you uh, would you like to do the honors? I would love to. Um, and I have a good physical book, which I like. Safety. We share conflicting viewpoints without fear. In 2012, Google launched Project Aristotle an internal research effort intended to identify why some teams excelled and others did not. Google looked at a number of factors, team composition, socialization outside work, educational background, extroversion versus introversion, co-location versus remote, seniority, team size, individual performance, and much more. None of them make a significant difference to effectiveness, not even seniority or individual performance. What mattered? psychological safety. Of the five key dynamics of effective teams that researchers identified, psychological safety was by far the most important. The Google researchers found that individuals on team with higher psychological safety are less likely to leave Google. They're more likely to harness the power of diverse ideas from their teammates. They bring in more revenue and they're rated as effective twice as often by executives from the book, Understanding Team Effectiveness. Although Google's findings have brought psychological safety into the limelight, it's not a new idea. It was originally introduced in 1965 by Edgar Schein and Juan Bennis in the context of making personal and organizational changes. In order for discomfort to lead to an increased desire to learn rather than heightened anxiety, an environment must be created with maximum psychological safety. Understanding psychological safety. Psychological safety, often abbreviated to just safety because modern offices have physical safety covered, is the ability to be yourself without fear of negative consequences, whether to your career, status, or self-image. It is the ability to propose ideas, ask questions, raise concerns, and even make mistakes without being punished or humiliated. Safety does not mean that your team has no conflict. It means the exact opposite. It means that everyone on your team is able to express their opinion without fear of attribution or belittlement. They are safe to disagree with each other. And they do. It may be uncomfortable, yet it is still safe. Through that creative tension, they consider ideas that might have been forgotten. They take into account objections that could have been swept under the rug. In the end, everyone's voice is heard, and that creates better results. Thank you, Gita. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read the entire section, uh, please be sure to do so. There is a lot of wisdom and experience in there. Uh, it is currently up for free on jameshore.com slash s slash aoad2. And of course, you can buy the book uh, or print the ebook or print edition uh, from Amazon or your favorite bookseller. So, first discussion prompt. What does psychological safety look like for you? Um, on the Discord, and as usual, we've been having some good discussion on the Discord. Uh, the link for that is uh, jameshore.com slash s slash aoad2 discord. Um, Jerome wrote, uh, as someone who's worked in the, at the same company for over 12 years and has risen through the ranks, I personally feel psychologically safe. I can, however, see that not everyone is in the same position as me, so all of the below really only applies to me. And to answer the question of what does that look like for me, it's the ability to question everything and let a discussion form and try new ideas without needing to ask permission or being afraid of what might happen. So here's, and then he goes on to say, uh, here's a few things I did without asking permission or having any fear. I uh, started multiple discussions on topics that most would probably not broach, totally changed how one team hired its next team member by allowing the team to make almost all the decisions of what process would be and how would they be involved. Started hosting viewing learning parties, um, provided uh, candid feedback to people who are higher up on the org chart, 
I am my, I am myself when at work. I rarely, if ever, feel like I'm putting on a facade. And there's more on the Discord that mm -hmm. I'll let you look at if uh, if you're interested. So, um, how how would you respond to that, Gita? What is what does psych psychological safety look like in practice in your experience? I actually think that this sounds like a lot of of the things. Um, but it's the fact that you can give feedback to somebody above you without it being um, nice feedback. Um, the fact that you can help a team make a totally different decision. Uh, the fact that you can speak up and, and have discussions. And I think these are essential. And I think it's important that it's not just the teams who need to feel safe. It's also the leaders who need to feel safe. But they are also the ones kind of originating it. And by showing that you are not afraid to start a topic, even if it's controversial. You are also showing people that it's okay to start controversial sub uh, topics. So that means that by, by being that role model, you are helping others see that this is actually okay in this company. But then you, of course, you also need to step in if, if like somebody uh, more junior or lower in the hierarchy speaks up and it's not accepted then you need to react to that and make sure that it is accepted. So it needs to be kind of equal, but it's about feeling that, that, you know, even though something might be uncomfortable to bring up, you can do it without being punished in whatever form that is. Mm -hmm. uh, love to hear, as always, this is of course a, a uh, discussion opportunity. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, those of you watching, uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to to share your thoughts. Um, so, what does what does that look like in in practice, Gita? If if I'm in an organization where uh, where people aren't psychologically safe, what kind of differences in behavior will I see from ones where they are? Um, like one of the things you, you, you see in organizations that don't feel safe is that people rarely disagree. Hmm. Um, and sometimes it can look like there's harmony, but it can be false harmony because people are afraid to speak up. Um, so um, I really love when, when I looked at Amy Edmondson's TED Talk, how she talks about that the department that had the most medical errors was actually the department where people felt most safe. And because they were safe enough to report the errors, whereas in some of the other ones, people were afraid to speak up about it. Um, so, so what I see in organizations that are safe is more, there are more discussions, people speak up, people disagree, but in a respectful way. Um, and, but also that people, of course, fail because that's part of it. And sometimes we do, like we step on toes. Uh, one of the examples, like in this organization I'm in now, we have more than 40 different nationalities. And we have people coming from, uh, we have like what this one guy from Mexico said when he was here in the beginning, he had to get used to not, um, you know, embracing uh, women and giving them a kiss on the cheek. That's how he would greet women he didn't even know in Mexico. But here that would be kind of like, okay, you need to take a step back. But in a safe environment, you can say that. It's kind of like, whoa, that was a little bit too close. Would you take a step back? Whereas in an unsafe environment, you would just not say anything because you would be afraid that somebody would say, oh, you're just so, such a prune, for instance. So being able to speak up about these things, I think, is very essential for that indicates a safe organization. But it is really, really hard to to see because when it's not there, it's not always obvious, which is why uh, Amy has this um, seven questions that you can ask and you need to ask them anonymously, of course, and hope that people speak the truth to figure out how safe is the environment actually. Mm -hmm. um, you, made a, you made a point at the, er, earlier saying that um, the, or the parts of the hospital that saw the most errors were actually the ones that were the most safe, and it reminds me of um, of some some uh, research that was quoted in the book uh, Understanding Human Error, which mm -hmm. said that as the incidence of error went down, uh, fatal accidents went up. 
Uh, this is yeah. in the construction and uh, airline industries. And I, it, of course, all of this stuff is related, right? But it just feels like the same sort of, uh, same sort of thing. But we've seen it with Boeing. We saw the two planes that fell down because people were not speaking up about the errors that were in there. And when they started really digging into it, there were so many bugs, both physical and and software bugs, that um, it's only luck that only two pl- uh, planes fell down. But yeah. people were bullied to be quiet. That uh, that also reminds me of um, I don't I'm not sure how true the story is, uh, but I recall read and it's been a while. But I recall reading that in certain uh, certain Asian airlines, they were having problems with the co-pilot being afraid to correct the pilot. Uh, and mm-hmm. so there were some high, pro- high profile accidents as a result. And so they changed it. So the co-pilot would do the flying and the captain would uh, provide the corrections to, yeah. uh, to prevent those errors. Um, you had mentioned that uh, it's important for leadership to feel safe as well, which was, was a great insight, which I hadn't considered. Um, what is what does that look like when when leaders when leaders feel safe? What is what does that involve? How does that happen? For me, it's also it's about the leaders feeling safe enough to show their vulnerability. Hmm. Um, like Amy Appleton talks about that as a leader, showing your fallibility uh, is important to help uh, people that you lead feel safe. But I think a lot of leaders don't feel safe enough to to admit their mistakes because a lot of the ways we have management and leadership today is kind of like you need to be that perfect one. And that's why you are the ones that made the step higher than everyone else. Um, So being allowed to speak up about, yeah, I actually made a mistake or uh, showing emotions. One of the things I think has damaged, well, our industry a lot is the whole emotions don't belong at work, but of course emotions belong at work. We're humans. And, um, and even the fact that a leader cares about people and wants people to feel good at work can in some places be unsafe to disclose because they might lose their job because, you know, we don't want people, we need people who produce something, who deliver results. We don't want them to just go around and fuss around people. Um, so having leaders who talk about when they make mistakes or, um, you know, talk about when who doesn't always come with a smile every day. Of course, there are people who are happy most of the time, but also saying, you know what? Today was a tough day. Um, So so where you feel safe enough to do that as a leader, um, but also say, you know what? Today was an amazing day. I think sometimes we also, when we talk about emotions, we only think about the negative ones, but we also want the positive ones. That is a a great point. Thank you. Barney has his hand up. Uh, Barney, welcome to the show. Hi. Um, I was just thinking about what you said about leaders showing vulnerability and how that ties in with imposter syndrome. Because I think a lot of people, as they progress up the hierarchy, maybe we feel more and more like they're just winging it. And at some point they'll get found out that they're not really good enough to be there. So showing that vulnerability maybe becomes even harder for them um, because they don't want to show the people who are below them that they got there by chance rather than through skill. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah and I think point. that's something we need to address as well. Um, I think the first time I learned about the imposter syndrome, I was like, whoa, I thought I was the only one. I'm the only one who cheated my way in here. Um, and I mean, I, I meet so many people who have this imposter syndrome and and yes, you don't want to say that to people, but I think learning that ex- imposter syndrome exists and then saying, realizing that I only have the imposter syndrome because I'm good at what I do, because that's part of the definition. So if you can logically know that and start speaking about that to your people, it's like, I know that sometimes you feel like you might only be here because you're lucky, but I can tell you that you're not. And I, I struggle with the same sometimes. Um, to kind of show people it's okay that you have these feelings and it's actually quite normal. A lot of people have feel this way, but I do think the imposter syndrome makes it even harder. And uh, for leaders, I think you're right in that. 
Thanks for your comments, Marnie. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next discussion prompt, which is uh, to share a story about a time that you've seen safety emphasized well or poorly. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of stories, Gita, about uh, uh, either of those cases. Uh, do you have one you'd like to share now? Um, I don't have one on top of mind, actually. Um, like you say, I've, I've seen many. Um, I think on safety is something that I see the most. I see people not speaking up about things that I know is there. Um, speaking up about, they speak up about, you know, in corners, so to say, they, they hide in corners, they whisper, but then they stand in front of their manager, for instance, and their manager asks, I think it's okay and everything is fine. Mm -hmm. So I see way too many examples of that. But I also see examples of, I've seen examples where, you know, someone goes up to the manager and says, what you did there was not okay. Um, you actually made me feel small. And seeing someone go up to a manager and say that makes me know that that person feels safe. Mm. Um, and that was, it, it felt really, it felt bad that the manager had said what he said, but it felt good that the person had um, fe felt safe enough to go up and say, you know what, that was not okay. Uh, on the Discord, uh, we had a few stories come out, so I think I'll share some of those now. And I'd love to also hear from all of you watching. Um, Jay Bazuzzi wrote on the Discord uh, a story of a success and a failure. Uh, success, uh, in a recent ensemble, there's one person who was first to say, I feel afraid to speak up about this, but I'm going to try anyway. And they did so, and the group responded, responded in a supportive way. After that, everyone knew that speaking up that way is probably safe in this group. This happened repeatedly, compounding on itself, and now that group is great at speaking openly, which helps them discuss chop topics that otherwise might go ignored. Um, another story of, I think this was success, let me make sure. Um, Thomas Owens wrote, uh, at a past organization, there was a big push for continuing education. Managers in the engineering organization promoted courses on leadership, teamwork, communication, conflict resolution, and mediation, negotiation, encouraging people at all levels from recent grabs to the senior technical contributors to team leads and managers really did well for people, helping people to understand how they communicate different communication styles and tailoring communication to different people. This helped individuals have open, honest communication across all levels. And then um, uh, Drew, Port Drew Bryan also has a story. Uh, years ago, I worked on a team that worked in one week iterations where new code was deployed to production every week. One week through a series of unnoticed missteps, we managed to inadvertently steps, sidestep our controls and deploy a version of our application that was almost a year old into our production environment. Almost immediately, the phone rang and people started reporting all kinds of issues. Quickly, our team rallied to assess what had happened. They put together to revert the change, a uh, plan to revert the change, worked on as, as a single unit to respond quickly, communicating, assessing, planning, coordinating, resolving, and a monitoring. When all was said and done, we met as a team, reviewed what happened, and came up with some better controls to prevent that from happening in the future. We used it to improve the deployment. No blame, no accusations, just a team using it as an opportunity to improve. Um, during the event, we notified our director. He asked if we needed anything to resolve it. He confirmed we were communicating, coordinating, and offered his assistance, but didn't feel the need to jump in, micromanage, or drive the remediation efforts. He knew we took pride in our product and understood our customers, so he trusted our decisions. He also knew we would review and find opportunities to improve after the fact. He trusted the system and our team. These all sound like amazing places to work. I mean, who, who wouldn't want to work in an environment with this level of support? Um, do you see, you know, as you're helping uh, companies uh, reach psychological safety, um, how do you see people sort of change and, and the, the mood of the organization change over time? Is it something, that, and also, is that something that it's, is uh, a long time coming or is it, is it uh, something that can be done quickly? It takes a long time. And, and depending on where the organization is, it takes longer um, so like the, the, when I started introducing this, um, we actually, ex so I was working in a tribe and we were, um, expecting people to feel fairly safe. And when we did the survey, we found out that there were actually people, 7% thought that somebody in their own team would deliberately undermine them. And, and seeing things like that was like, whoa. 
and we worked on this and we started out by first helping people understand what safety is, then working in its team. And the really big results came after a year where all of a sudden we saw people, for instance, being asking, is it okay if I go to this other team and work with them for, for a sprint? Um, or people you know, coming up with their own ideas or starting to push back going talking to managers two levels up which before were like the big managers but now they were kind of like yeah okay they're the leaders but they are they also the ones who can help us um so i see these small signs and i mean like the last story there where you do something that is fairly big um and still your manager trusts you to not only fix it but learn from it but he's still there to support you i think that's a great example um and and anyone who's in that team who hasn't experienced this before would be like, whoa, that's how it can be. And then hopefully spread it to other places. But it takes a while also because we are damaged or conditioned from other places. So we ha- each have some patterns that we do because something happened to us somewhere else. Um, so it's it's very individual what makes you feel safe. Hmm. So that's discussions that you need to have in organizations as well. So um, you mentioned a year to to get to the point where people were starting to feel safe. That's obviously a, a really big investment on the part of the organization. Mm-hmm. What what sort of what what motivates the organizations you work with to to work on that? Uh, where what value are they seeing that that makes it worth the uh, time and effort? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm so I mean, they do get results earlier, but the really big ones came in this case came after a year. I think what they see is two things. First of all, you get happier people because people don't have to worry all the time about, am I making a mistake? Is something going to happen to me? Will I get fired if I don't make this on time? Um, but then they also see the results because, because people start making small experiments, taking chances, uh, maybe disagreeing um, and saying, hey, I don't think it's a good idea if we do this because this happened, even though somebody senior or a manager says this is a good idea. They get better products. They get better services. They get better everything. Because even if you are like most junior coming from university, you might be the one asking that question and goes, oh, the emperor is naked. We need to do something about this. We need to change this because you get so used to these things. So creating environments where anyone feels they can speak up about things or come up with a new idea creates better products in the end because it helps us be more innovative. And of course, not everything we we suggest or, or see as problems is a problem, but if we don't bring it up, we'll never know. Hmm. Yeah. And I would think that the uh, the aspect where people are happier to work, more comfortable, would be particularly important right now, where we are seeing you know the so called great resignation. Uh, retaining people is is really hard, and it's, yeah. and it's losing people. Turnover is super expensive. Um, yeah. You you want people to feel comfortable staying in your organization. And then, of course, the the benefits of people actually speaking up. I see so many stories about people saying, oh yeah, I'm just going to keep my head down and not say anything about that because it's not worth my job. Um, yeah. But that's not healthy for the organization at all. No. Um, um, Marin has her hand up. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, welcome to the show, Marin. Thank you. Yes, you pronounced it perfectly. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to add to get this point about innovation. So I come from the field of creativity and in my creativity workshops, creating a safe environment to propose ideas and then discuss them in a constructive manner is really, really important. So just to build on that, in when we're dealing with complex challenges, uh, we need to be creative. We need to be um, daring to venture into new areas. So their psychological safety is really, really important. And um, yeah, it just plays hand in hand. Thanks very much for your comments, Marin. Uh, the, uh, the next prompt that we had, the next discussion prompt, um, and I invite, invite you all to, to uh, 
to share your experiences and thoughts as well. Um, is have you worked on a team where somebody had trouble speaking up, and what did you what did you do to help them? And I, I'm going to ask you to kick us off with that, Gita. For we've got a lot of people who work on teams. Um, what can they do at sort of the individual level to help help the other folks on their team who might be uncomfortable speaking up uh, feel safer? So one of the things um, that I've done, for instance, is if there's someone who has problems speaking up, um, having conversations with them about maybe if there's something important that they want to speak up about, let's say in a team meeting, preparing it before, uh, like there's some stuff I want to bring up in a retrospective, but I am afraid I'll be misunderstood. Then practicing with people before and kind of like, so what do you want to say? And then once they've said it once, it helps. Um, other things I, I do, if I'm facilitating something, I, I very often start with a round where everyone says something positive that happened the last two weeks. And part of that is you use your voice once in that meeting already, so it can be easier to do it again. Um, but otherwise, I, I will mostly work with coaching and, and helping that person. And if, if it's someone like I'm meeting at a conference, like what can I do myself? I will say, find a buddy in the team, find someone where if you feel insecure, you can look over to that person and go, yeah, they have my back. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, then it's easier to speak up about these things. Um, so actually Diana Larson did that for me when I did my first public talk. Uh, she was there. She was my anger in the audience. And every time I felt like, oh, no, I shouldn't be on stage. I could just look at Diana and she would sit there and be my friend in the audience. Um, yeah. That really helped. Diana is fast, fantastic in that way. Um, of course, we know each other well, Diana and I. And um, I, I know that I can count on if I'm if I'm having a talk and she's in the audience, I will look at her and she'll be sni- smiling and nodding along to what yeah. I say. And it's just so, so comforting to know that there's at least one person who who likes what I have to say. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, one of the comments in the Discord about this question was um, from Thomas Owens, uh, who says, I honestly wish I had a good answer for this one, but demonstration is the best I've seen. Unfortunately, demonstration is hard unless you have someone like the person you're demonstrating to, even if a very junior person or someone from an underrepresented group or someone who has had bad experiences experiences with safety in the past sees these positive interactions in an environment where it's safe to express or challenge ideas, they may not feel comfortable doing so. I think demonstration over time is the best I've seen with people coming out of their shells and feeling safe. So what do you think of that idea of, of demonstration and what, what might that look like uh, in practice? I think the role modeling kind of like, I think that's a big part of what we do. Uh, and I sometimes joke, like, it's a little bit like you have kids, you tell them not to curse, but if you curse yourselves, they will do it. And mm-hmm. um, so just like with all of us, we, we more than what we hear, we also do what we see. And if you see that other people are speaking up, um, then then you see, oh, oh, that person actually spoke up, that person spoke up. Um, and and people listened to them and gave them a, a good answer. I think that's a really good way of doing it. Um, and you can also kind of help along and, and say, oh, we discussed something in the break. John, would you like to share what you just said outside? Because I thought that was such a great idea. So kind of giving them that support. Um, but I think the demonstration being the role models, people seeing that this is actually okay, whether it is speaking up or making a mistake or saying in the meeting, you know what, I failed. I know I should have done this, but I didn't. I'm sorry. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, it, you know, as, as a coach and a, and a, as a mentor to a lot of teams, people and teams myself, it definitely seems that, you can say something or you can even show a presentation and people will see that and they'll just sort of translate it into whatever their internal biases are. But if they, if they see something demonstrated, if they are, people seem to learn more through imitation than, Mm -hmm. than through uh, reading or, 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 uh, or watching a video or something like that. Yeah. Um, Another comment in the, Oh, actually the, Drew Bryan has his hands up. Drew, welcome back to the show. Oh, I'm going to invite you to unmute again. Hey, 
How's that? <laughs> yeah, coming through great. Hi, Drew. Good morning. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I was I was going to mention the concept of facilitation along with that too. Um, one of the things I've seen a lot in teams is um, if a if a meeting or an interaction or a retrospective is facilitated by someone who's truly a neutral third party uh, to the conversation, then that does a good job of encouraging. But if it's facilitated either uh, by someone who has an agenda who's pushing for a particular motivation or or just not facilitated well. And one of the things I've seen a lot is uh, teams gel more is facilitation tends to get more lax and the group just comes together and talks. Uh, but a lot of times in that you can end up with, you know, the same three people talking all the time uh, in a team of seven. And uh, if there's not kind of a structured facilitation mechanism that's intentional for getting people to speak up or giving everyone a voice or a turn, you know, and I, th there's a lot of just creative methods. I've seen. I, I was in a uh, session a while back where the facilitator just every time someone spoke up had everyone's name on a whiteboard and would just tally, you know, and so you started to see over time who's spoken and who hasn't. And it just gives a visual representation in front of everyone of who's got the airtime. And it's just simple things like that that just start to create that space. Uh, and I think if you don't do that and aren't intentional, then otherwise you start to create that culture and that mindset where it's okay for just three people to speak every time. That's great. Thank you, Drew. Um, uh, what kind of facilitation techniques have you seen? Well, actually, I, I was just going to say, I uh, one of the things when we worked with teams was um, we asked them to, uh, we kind of did a sort of a retrospective workshop, but focused on safety. And one of the teams, we actually had the two developers who spoke the most was like, we think this is a problem because we don't hear the other voices, but we forget it in the situation. So what can we do? And they came up with the idea that every time that they could not make an important decision unless everyone had spoken. Um, so that's one thing you can do is kind of do that. And I think that I like the idea of actually noting down, making it very visible. Um, but I think the, the neutral facilitator is, of course, the best. And But very often we don't have that. But kind of keeping an eye on people. Um, I find it hard to do sometimes online, but if you have people in the room, people leaning forward, like they're almost going to say something. And then you can kind of say, um, do you have anything to add or make sure there's a silence? Um, I've used the methods from the book Time to Think a few times where you, where Nancy Klein talks about that, you know, you speak, you have a turn to speak, everyone. And just having these rounds once in a while, not all the time, because then it becomes a little bit strange, but sometimes just taking this round and saying, I would like to hear your opinion and having the rule that you can't interrupt people. I find that's a good technique to to have all voices heard. But it, like you say, it, it means that you have to do things deliberately and not just sit and talk, which is very easy if you know each other well. Yeah, I think facilitation is one of those things that people hear and think, oh, anybody can do that. But it's actually, a, it's, a, it's a real skill and an art. Um, Maren has her hand up again. Uh, Maren, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Um, I would like to add on again. Um, I really like the kind of warm up uh, ideas, either check in or having everybody say something. What I sometimes do in my facilitation um, facilitations is ask for written input that either mm -hmm. then somebody else um, can read out loud or I do so that um, they feel heard, even if they don't like to speak up. And once that's happened a bit, um, that evens out the playing field a bit. So they feel heard and know that their contribution is welcome. That, uh, that's, that's a great point. It reminds me of a technique I like to use, which is that of course, in the software field, we have a lot of introverts who, who can be pretty uncomfortable speaking up. And so I try to build into any time I'm facilitating, particularly in a larger group, time for people to just think to themselves rather than having the group discussion that we all, you know, we all facilitators tend to love. Um, uh, and of course, there's the one, two, four, all technique, which is yeah. where you start out thinking to yourself, what do I think about this? And then merging those ideas together is something that works particularly well for large groups. Um, and I, I like that technique, particularly because it gives the introverts time to just think on their own to start out. Thanks for the comments, Marin. Did you want to respond to that, Gita? You know, I, I love that one. I I used to call it the funnel um, because you kind of you spread out. And I think that's a really good one because what I also find is that you have an opportunity to get your voice heard, but you don't have to necessarily speak up. 
because you just talk to that one person. Now the other person knows, and then you're a group of four. So if you don't feel up, feel like speaking up when there's more, yeah. um, that's a good way. And I feel like, especially when we are online, it seems more important to divide people up in small groups because somehow if you are eight people in a room, you dare speak up. But if you're eight people in a meeting, there's not the same tendency for people to speak up the same way, except for those of us who always speak up, including me. Um, but there are, there are people who are not as good at just t- stepping in and taking the stage. I, I would agree with that. The, the uh, video conferences do seem to work, seem to only work well with smaller numbers of people than, than in person. Um, we had several book clubs back. We, we were talking about, you know, how do we coordinate and communicate well? And uh, one tool that came up is called Gather, which I've recently been experimenting with. It's at gather.town. And this is a physicalized environment where people can move around to uh, make little conversation circles, which I think are potentially a tool for, again, larger groups, having those small conversations, making it safe for people to talk in a small group and then have somebody else speak up uh, for them in the larger group setting. Um, we are running out of time, but I want to get to our last discussion prompt. Again, love to hear from all of you. Um, and this one, just want to get really down to brass tacks. And we've kind of been already talking about this. But if you think about your current team, or for Gita, I guess, if, if you have thoughts about what people who are on teams can do, uh, what could your te- current team do to improve safety for team members? Uh, Chris M wrote on the discord, I think we could be more open and transparent about our mistakes, sharing more frequently the mistakes we make and what we learn from them and can help build a culture of learning and growth and help other fields, others feel safer on the team. Uh, Drew Bryan wrote a uh, few thoughts here. Uh, safety first safety is everyone's job, not just management or leaders. And second facilitation is important. Uh, as, as has been mentioned, a lot of teams are well-intended, but don't focus the time and effort to invest in facilitation methods. As a result, we don't always give everyone an opportunity to speak and protect against a small number of talkers getting all the airtime. So, uh, in the last couple of minutes we have here again, love to hear from all of you, but Gita, do you have sort of. If, if somebody's in an organization where they and on a team and they really want to help uh, create more safety in their team, um, where would you suggest they start? Well, so um, Amy Edmondson talks about what to do for leaders, and but I think it, it applies for everyone, is um, be curious. Ask people, oh, that's really interesting. What a good idea. Or, and then show your own fallibility. So whether you are, um, like right now I'm a manager, so in that way I am a leader, but you can also be, you could be anyone, you will be a, a, a small leader. And by showing that example and saying, oh, I made a mistake here, or I thought this was really interesting, showing that curiosity and showing that that you also make mistakes and that, you, that uh, whether you are in a team or close to a team, uh, and then also encouraging people with your curiosity. I think that's kind of the first step in building that safety. Yeah, I, I love learning that. Learning to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I love that idea of, um, I love both those ideas, but I love that idea of showing vulnerability, saying, you know, showing that it's okay to make mistakes by admitting mistakes. And And you mentioned in the book, admit mistakes, but don't take blame for the mistakes. Don't don't flagellate yourself, you know, don't beat yourself up over the mistakes, but just talk about, well, this was a mistake and this is what I've learned. Um, and the being quiet, of course, is, is a technique that I'm obviously not practicing right now, but have practiced in the past of, I've noticed that when I'm coaching a team, sometimes I need to just not be there for a little while. Cause if, if mm-hmm. I'm there, people wait for me to do all the talking, but if I leave, if I physically leave, then other people will start to speak up. Speaking of allowing other people to speak up, uh, Barney has had his hand up. Barney, uh, welcome to the show. Hello again. Um, just want to come back to, I think it was Drew's point and about how psychological safety is everyone's responsibility. And I'm slightly wary of that. Um, you know, I'm a straight white man in a position of seniority in my organization, and it's quite easy for me to show vulnerability. It's, it's quite safe, really, for me to do that. Um, for somebody who's lower down in the organization, who is not a straight white man, asking, I don't want to put the burden on them to, 
to show you know to create safety. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't the, boat, the owner should not be on those who are vulnerable to create safety. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I I agree with you. The way I I hear it is more. We need to be aware that we can create unsafety for others. Uh, in my quest, in when I do my workshops, one of the questions I ask people to think about is. Um, what do I do that might make other people feel unsafe? And that usually startles people because they don't think about that each of us does things that make people feel safe or unsafe. And sometimes it's not even on purpose, but um, like I have senior developers who are very aware that if they do a code review or a pull request, that they don't go, oh, this is simple. You should just do this. Even saying that, even if you want to encourage people, um, but I think you're right. The more down the chain you are, so to say, the, the un, more unsafe it is to show that uh, vulnerability. And I, this is not from theory, but as a person, I believe that the more privileged we have, the more it would be good if we step forward. Like, like I'm white. I live in a country where I have food every day. Um, I have a good education. Um, you know, I have a lot of privileges. And in, I am in a position where I can just say fuck you to my boss because I can go out and find a new job. So, of course, I'm in a position of privilege, but use that to help others that might not be as privileged. Um, but I don't think that you have more responsibility as a privileged person, but I think we can choose to take that upon us. Thanks so but much. it shouldn't be up to the people who are the less privileged because those are the ones we need to help. Thanks so much, Kita, And thank you for bringing up that topic, Barney. I think that could have been a really interesting discussion. Um, do see uh, some more hands raised, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, thank you all for participating. Uh, Gita, thank you so much for joining and offering your experience and wisdom today. Um, uh, Gita Klitgard is, uh, as I said, is um, uh, agile coach, trainer, and mentor focusing on helping organizations implement psychological safety, responsibility, and accountability, and the author of the section on psychological safety in the book. Uh, Gita, thanks so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, next week, we are going to mix things up a bit uh, to give a better mix of delivering and focusing topics. I'm going to start alternating between parts two and three of the book. So next week's topic is pairing and mobbing. And Woody Zool and Chris Lucian have both graciously agreed to be the uh, our special guests for this session. Uh, I see some excitement in the audience. Uh, glad to hear that. Um, of course, uh, Woody is the originator of mob programming, and uh, Chris is an experienced practitioner who helped Woody found mob programming at Hunter's Industries. So this should be a great session. I will be putting the announcement up and uh, the, along with the free reading up soon. So keep an eye on the RSS feed at jameshore.com or follow the discord at jameshore.com slash s slash aoad2 discord for more information. That is it. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you again, Gita. And uh, I will see you all next week.